Okay, so I actually split this into two lessons. I was going to do it in one lesson, but that'd be a bit too long and complicated. So we're looking at why Hitler was appointed Chancellor by Hindenburg in January 1933. But this first video will look at the reasons behind the electoral success of the Nazi party between the period 1930 and 1932. So why did they experience electoral success? Was it the Great Depression? It's tempting. When you look at this graph, now the sort of pink continuous line here is unemployment. And you can see after 1930, unemployment rises significantly, and by the middle of 1932, it's close to 30%, 6 million people. And it appears that the Nazi vote is rising in line with unemployment. And a simplistic uh, but mistaken uh, correlation would be that, oh, unemployed people are voting for the Nazis. Well, we'll see that the Great Depression did help the Nazis in gaining votes, but it wasn't that unemployed people were voting for the Nazis in vast numbers. They basically managed to exploit the Great Depression more effectively and ably better than other parties. They exploited the circumstances of the Great Depression. Well, what circumstances are we talking about? From 1930, effectively, Weimar democracy failed. It ground to a halt. A coalition government, which had been assembled by Stresemann, basically broke up. They could not agree what to do about the Great Depression. The left-wing parties did not want to cut spending, while the right-wing parties did want to cut spending. These are all fairly central parties, the Social Democrats and the middle class parties, where they could not agree and the coalition broke up. In a new round of elections, both the communists on the left and the Nazis on the right gained a bigger share of the vote. And what effectively meant was, even if the democratic parties in the middle had wanted to form a coalition, they now had less than 50%. There's no way the communists would work with the Nazis. And so basically from 1913 there was no functioning coalition. This meant that when using Article 48, um, basically well, chancellors had to rely on Hindenburg both to appoint, not, not only to appoint them, but if chancellors wanted to achieve anything, they had to persuade Hindenburg to pass any law using Article 48, bypassing the gridlocked uh, Reichstag. So effectively, democracy was already, if not completely dead, it was on a life support machine from 1930. So, first factor there, created by the Great Depression, the failure of democracy, the breakup of the coalition, and use of Article 48 by Hindenburg in effectively almost a dictatorial way. The left themselves, the KPD, the Communists, and the SPD, the more moderate socialists, they failed to unite and recognise the extent of the Nazi threat, partly because, if you remember, the Social Democrats had used the right-wing paramilitary Freikorps to crush the Spartacist uprising, and the Spartacists became the KPD, so the left failed to unite. A really significant factor for the Nazis was propaganda. Now, the fact is, though, that every single party used propaganda, not only the Nazis. But how were they able to exploit uh, propaganda much more effectively, where they certainly had more energy, organisation, and they used more modern technologies uh, more effectively. Here's a poster uh, which says, Our Last Hope Hitler. Um, the Nazis exploited the fact that the Nazis themselves had never been in power and that democracy seemed to be failing. Notice as well, this is something that the Nazis do quite effectively. They've, you've got like a sort of working class person over here, or a middle class looking person over here, or a mother over here. They're very much trying to appeal to every sector of German society. Much as the name National Socialist tries to appeal to left wing and right wing views, the other parties, the Communists, the Social Democrats, the Catholic Centre Party, these are all targeted at different groups in society. So you're going to get your unskilled workers voting for the Communists. You're going to get your skilled workers in the cities tending to vote more for the Social Democrats, Catholics voting for the Catholic Party, right-wing nationalists voting for the right-wing DNVP party. Well, these were in a way sectional. They all targeted a different part of German society. Uh, the Nazi party tried to appear to be the party for all at the same time as trying to target every section of German society. So they presented themselves as a party for all Germans whilst 
aiming different messages of propaganda at different groups. See if you can figure out what these are aimed at. Well, it's fairly clearly that one's aimed at women. Uh, they promoted family values, hoping to get more sort of conservative women to vote Nazi. Here you've got um, work, freedom and bread. This is sort of designed to appeal to your unemployed workers. They had messages for farmers as well, uh, for the middle class. Here's a poster which is exploiting middle class fears of communism and portraying the order and discipline of Hitler and his brown shirts as being the solution to communism. So very much targeted propaganda and presenting themselves as a new party, not part of the failed Weimar democracy. You can't ignore Hitler's speaking skills. Often, if you look on YouTube, you'll find videos of Hitler's speeches, and it, it seems odd to a modern-day audience that this scratchy little voice and this odd, uh, dramatic little man would, would rivet crowds, but he did. People talk about being electrified. If you look at this image, it almost looks like a pop concert. If you substitute Hitler for, I, I'm sorry, I don't know any modern pop stars, Justin Bieber, I think he's probably been in God, hasn't he? But basically, Hitler, very popular, very charismatic, very effective speaker. And this was an example of both uh, effective Nazi propaganda, energy, organisation, putting a lot of effort into it are all over the country, and also use of technology. In 1932, Hitler actually ran for the presidential election against Hindenburg. It had been seven years since Hindenburg became president in 1925. So the campaign was called the Führer over Germany. It's another example of effective use of technology, basically, and organisation and energy and how much effort was put into it. Hitler flew all around the country delivering speeches. Uh, often he'd be in uh, two or three cities in a single day. Now, he did not win but he did gain 11 million votes to Hindenburg's 17 million votes. And this ensured that he had a national presence and seemed like a serious politician. So the 1932 presidential election, a good example of both Nazi use of effective propaganda and technology, as well as being combined with Hitler's speaking skills. Now let's have a look now at some of the votes that occur over the period. You should definitely make a note of these. Obviously history is about understanding and comparing and analysing, but you do need to know some facts, and I do recommend that you jot these down and commit them to memory somehow. So in 1928, this is obviously before the Great Depression bites, it was remember the Nazis only have 12 seats in Parliament. The Nazis are represented by this brown section at the bottom here. These are purple and blue are the sort of middle class, the blue are the middle class parties, the purple is the right wing DNVP, yellow is for the Catholic Centre Party, the pink are the Social Democrats, and the red colour here are the KPD, the Communists. So in 1928, very small share of the overall vote. By 1930, as the Great Depression has started to bite, you can see the share of the Nazi vote increasing. It's around about 18% here. 107 seats in Parliament. But who are they getting it from? If you look at the communists, well, their share of the vote is actually increasing, so they're, they're not stealing the vote away from communists. They do appear to possibly be getting some Social Democrat voters, but not many. The Social Democrat vote remains fairly consistent throughout this period. The Catholics, they don't appear to be getting hardly many votes from the Catholics, but ah, look over here. They appear to be squeezing votes from the middle class parties and the traditional right-wing party, the DNVP. Again, this trend continues. Their peak vote in democratic elections, 230, that's 37% of the vote. They are, in 1932, the largest single party in the Reichstag, although you can see they're not a majority. And again, you can see the trend. They don't appear to have caught communist votes. In fact, communist votes have increased. Um, not so many social democrats. The Catholics aren't, don't seem to be voting for them. They really seem to have squeezed the middle class parties and the right wing parties. That appears to be where they're getting their votes from. Notice, though, that from this peak in July 1932 of 230, the vote actually starts to decline by November of 1932. So, clearly, Gaining this larger section of the vote makes Hitler more likely to be appointed Chancellor by Hindenburg. He appears to be a serious contender with a legitimate uh, claim to be appointed, but it's not the only factor in Hindenburg's appointment. You can see that obviously it's made him a serious contender, but also the votes are declining, and they're declining before he is appointed Chancellor. So electoral success is certainly a factor, but not 
simplistically the most direct factor while why he is important <laughs> excuse, excuse me why he is um, appointed Chancellor by Hindenburg a last point to make is that we've already said it really that it does seem to be middle class uh, and right wing voters that do seem to be attracted more towards the Nazi party and it appears to be the Nazi message of communism, fear of communism, because extremes of both Nazis and communists, the communists weren't gaining as much, but it appears that your middle class and right wing voters, many of them drifted to the Nazis out of a fear of communism, and they exploited this again very ably in their propaganda. So in summary, the Great Depression created circumstances which the Nazis exploited more ably and effectively than other parties. The failure of democracy from 1930 onwards, Hindenburg is basically ruling using Article 48, helps the Nazis as they have never been in a coalition government and they, and they present themselves as a strong leadership in contrast to the failure of democracy. The KPD and SPD were weak, as in fact were the middle class parties, so they didn't really have to contend with strong opposition. They had more effective propaganda, more energy and organisation. A good example is the Führer over Germany campaign, Hitler flying all over the place, gaining 11 million votes. They presented themselves as a party for all Germans, not just sections of society. And they also targeted propaganda at different groups in society. Hitler's speaking skills, uh, certainly played a part. He seemed to have mesmerised and transfixed crowds and together with a fear of communism this appears to have contributed to the increased Nazi vote making Hitler at least a more viable cam uh, candidate sorry, for appointment by Hindenburg. Okay, I hope you've made some uh, decent notes there.